Hi, how are you? Came in uh, this weekend because I really wanted to spend some time to go through the details of this latest icon derelict. This is a 1946 Oldsmobile Coupe. Super cool body style. I'm a big fan. Hopefully you are too. This car I wasn't really looking for. My hunters, you know, we have hunters that help us find cars for our clients. And uh, what happened was my hunters saw this car, just stumbled into it, and knew it was right up my alley. They were correct, so I grabbed it. I was actually judging at Pebble Beach, the, the big car show, and all fancy in a suit and supposedly paying attention, and I'm getting these text images of this car and like going on PayPal and trying to pay for it uh, while supposedly doing something else that was pretty important, but it was kind of fun. So when it showed up, it was just perfect. It was actually better than I thought it was going to be. Couldn't really tell if the patina was right or wrong because it was wet in the photos and sometimes that can make patina look like something it's not. So it shows up and it's glorious. It's super cool. Guy calls up, we start talking about derelict projects and he falls in love with the car as well. So we built this for him. This car is gonna stay in California. It's gonna be going up to NorCal. And um, it's really kind of a neat story. You know, all of these derelicts, as you know by now, are highly individual. They're very, very personal and that's really what they should be. Well, in this case, it brought with it some challenges for me because, you know, usually when someone calls me, rarely do they have a targeted exact car. And sometimes they do, or maybe it's a car a grandfather had or parents had or they had when they were younger, their first car or something from a movie, whatever. But in this case, my client is a very respected engineer. I mean, we're talking like NASA, Apple, like engineer engineer and car shop owners are always all oh, engineers they're the worst clients because they're going to tell you how to build it but they've never built anything in their lives well in this case that's not the kind of engineer we're dealing with this is a hands-on guy to the extent that he actually said when we launch it he's like you know I, I dig what you do and I want you to build the car but at the same time I have my own opinions some very specific ones and and Will you work with me? And of course, we did. So there are things in this car that you will notice are not what I normally do. Well, they're what the client felt made the car speak to him. So it was really a fun, fun process. And uh, we got to play with systems that we normally don't use. And uh, it came out really good. So when the car showed up, as you can see here, I took some quick video of it when it came. It was all complete, it was untouched, nothing altered, just 100% virgin. It had been sitting out in a field up in uh, northeastern California. And uh, I could just kind of see where I wanted to go with the car right away. Um, the patina was epic, all the trim was complete. Um, the dash, phenomenal. This dash is probably one of my favorite dash designs of this era. And uh, we'll get into that later. We went to great lengths to make it look like we didn't do anything to it, but we did some fairly extensive modifications to it. So basically, uh, on this car, we didn't have to do the laser scan of the body because fortunately, you know, with Pontiac, Oldsmobile, Chevrolet, all using the same chassis, I think from 41 to 47 or thereabouts, Art had already done several of these, so already had the chassis and cat, so that was cool. My client actually built the motor himself and even handmade those cool valve covers, so it is a cast iron 502 Chevy Big Block. The fuel system on it is a Hillborn injected system, which is pretty cool and nostalgic. It has a lopier idle and it's a bit thumpier and bumpier than what we normally do, but it gives the car a great bit of character. The exhaust system was built by our friend at Bent, who's quite the artist, as you can see. So we did long tube stainless steel 
TIG welded headers, and then TIG welded mandrel bent stainless exhaust all the way to back. When we first built the car, the exhaust was just too rowdy. So it's still quite rowdy, but we use um, turbo V-groove clamps. So that actually allowed us the flexibility to make alternate mufflers until we found a tone everybody was happy with. The exhaust is dual and it is isolated, which again was part of my client's vision for the exhaust sound. It's got really good, really good note to it. Tranny, to hold up to all that power, is the 4L85E, what uh, GM calls the Supermatic. So that is a modern computer controlled transmission with an electric overdrive. For chassis engineering, we did Art's tried and true independent front suspension, and we did a four link rear with Johnny joints and then tunable sway bars. For brakes, we are running the Willwood six piston front and four piston rear. And for the parking brake, we're running an e-stop electric parking brake, cleverly interfaced with the stock underdash handle. But it works a hell of a lot better than any of the mechanical linkage parking brakes. We also snuck in an ARB air locking differential in the rear axle. That is for good fun getting rowdy on dirt roads. You'll notice the stance of this car is slightly higher than normal. Again, that was with dirt roads in mind. And also the client wanted a bit of like a rum runner feel, you know, like an old prohibition car. So we picked, well actually he picked these Excelsior tires and rims. The rims were made by Icon, or actually by our buddies at Circle Racing for Icon, and the design was to emulate the original artillery wheels, but in a larger size and reduced weight. And then the original hubcaps were put right back on it. The only fake patina on this car is some of the trim. So the hubcaps, for example, were completely waxed and polished smooth and all the original paint was long gone and the emblem on the side belt line trim as well as on the hood was also worn clean and we wanted to get that color back in there so Tim Leventry who's a very skilled old school sign painter is a friend of ours and uh, we called Tim up and said hey can you paint it but not well or can you paint it well and then age it and scuff it back so it doesn't look like you just painted it? And I think you did a great job. The dash on this car is steel and it is painted to look like wood. That is Dead Nuts Factory for this model. Same with the garnish moldings around the windows. We had that professionally restored by a guy who does just that, all that and only that every day. And he did a really nice job. It came out very, very well. The windows, all glass in fact, except for the windshield, is tinted. It's tempered and tinted and not with a film. It's that architectural glass that we like to use on many of our projects and it gives it a really nice soft brown tint. It just kind of complements the antique feel of the whole car. On the inside, it looks dead stock, but it's actually not. I mean, it's the correct materials of the era, you know, the mohair and gabardine acres and acres of it in fact but the patterns are different than original we did have a swatch of the original stripe and um, we actually ended up doing something different so again of the era but not exactly right but i don't think anyone's going to know any better and i like the color balance of this one better we also changed which panels were striped and which panels were solid Originally, there was vinyl on the seat bottom and no leather details anywhere. And I like this Morin Gilles leather. We work with them a lot. And this had a great feel and tone that really matched the overall vibe of this car. So we added leather to the bottom of the door panels. We added leather to the top plane of the armrest and also in the lower trim panels for the seat. On the back plane of the front seat is a grab handle. That is original, but it would have been like a webbing or rope. 
So again, we took some of the leftover leather and braided that into a nice twine and it kind of just broke it up and added a nice little bit of design detail back there. The rear seat, stock configuration, stock patterns, front seat, we actually took about four inches out of the seat bottom to help with visibility. Cars of this era, especially these streamlined coupes, have a very low windshield line, so you're like this. When we first drove it and showed it at SEMA, it was just too tall, so when we came back to the shop, I said, we gotta do something about that. So we used a dense foam in the seat and reduced the height of the structure. For rugs on the car, we're using the Rolls-Royce Wilton wool, and that's Dynamat lined and Extreme Matte lined, and it is hemmed in the same leather. We did removable floor mats for the front, as well as the rear passenger floor area. And you'll also know in the trunk, there's another matching mat. The entire body was completely disassembled to absolutely nothing, put on a rotisserie fixture. The underside was media blasted to raw metal, and then that raw metal was thoroughly treated and then heat cured with a polyurea coating. The insides of the quarter panels and the doors were all coated in copious amounts of Dynamat after a pour 15 rust coating and then all welting door hinges lock cylinders and the like were all replaced with new of course all the door weather stripping window seals blah 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 all that stuff is new and my client wanted power windows so i hate as you know like those modern ugly plastic power window switches so we did this cool setup where we retained the original analog window crank and you simply nudge it down for down and up for up. The door handles, the window cranks, the wing window knobs, everything on this car, the details are just where it's at. Like there's these cool little chevrons on the door hardware. There's the Bakelite for the knobs. Really it's it's all just so lovely. I'm, I'm really a big fan of this car. The only thing cosmetically we really altered on this dash were the knobs and switches. So as with all of these projects, of course, I'm running modern um, military spec, full soldered, triple seal wiring harnesses done by our in-house electrical engineer, Mark. And we use Busman panels, so it uses contemporary relays and fuses, so you're not looking for any of the old dinosaur glass fuses or any of that nonsense. But back to the switches, you know, the knobs for the switches were all different designs and a couple different materials. And I think that's because, like most car companies, even in the 40s, they were looking to save money where they could, so they probably took switches and knobs from other applications. But I didn't like them, so I picked my favorite one, and then I modeled it in Fusion 360, built up the CAD model, and then we CNC those in stainless steel, and you'll notice we also uh, surface cut them, engraved them with their functions. So you've got lights, wipers, vent. I didn't bother marking the Siggy because the head's so small on it. We kept the original push start button at the client's request, which is kind of nostalgic and fun. And the AC integrated really clean. You know, there's this really cool knob on the dash that simply says raise, and that's for temperature. So all the way to the left is a low temperature burr for AC, and then all the way rotated clockwise is full hot. The vent controls and the fan speeds fit into stock cavities in the original dash with those new knobs that I spoke of. And then for the vents, there are two outboard vents, but they're hidden. You pretty much can't see them. They're flush under the dash. But in the center, we repurposed what originally would have been the speaker for the AM radio. So in these early cars, like that AM radio is huge. It's like that deep, and that wide. It's a total monster. So by getting rid of that, we make room for a larger glove box and our large vintage air air conditioning system. So 
Also, that allowed me to change out the mesh because the mesh that was on there when we tested it, it, it kind of muffled, it made a lot of noise and it didn't let the AC or whatever, the fan motor blow really well. Ended up finding this mesh, it's actually for like commercial filtration systems. It's this cool stainless steel linear weave and we repurposed that, trimmed it and tigged a bezel for it and then back mounted it to the original speaker opening. So it works out really nice and you get uh, really good air travel. For the sound system, while we're on that subject, again, the original radio is gorgeous. There's no way in hell I'm gonna put some ugly modern dancing dolphin graphic single den hideous junk that's gonna be worthless in a year. So more and more what I'm doing is either Bluetooth or lightning dependent audio systems. So in this case, we have both of those set up. And if you're going to use Bluetooth, you simply push this button right here to excite the Bluetooth signal and you get a little warning chime when engaged. And then the original tuner knob is for the primary system volume and then the little knurled stainless knob behind it is for the bass. All speakers are focal or focal, 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 I can never decide. The fronts are integrated into the dog leg kick vent area. We welded in stainless steel dog dishes actually on the backside coated in Dynamat to enclose it for better audio. And then we TIG welded up one of the stainless steel meshes like we use in the bumper or actually in the grill of the FJ and then hand built an aluminum panel, wrapped it and padded it and that took care of the front speakers. Rear speakers are built into the stock package tray, again behind stainless steel woven mesh screens. The amplifiers and the bass are all hidden in the trunk. You'll notice there is a false trunk wall that is removable with ease, but it's there so you don't have to look at all that stuff. It's all hidden behind, as is the ARB compressor for the locking differentials. That's why there's that air chuck fitting in back there because, well, just because, why not? You already have the compressor, you might as well plumb an air chuck. No spare tire, we decided to go with a larger gas tank and that's TIG welded stainless steel with an in-tank pump. So we integrated one of our brackets with a good old fashioned can of fix a flat. Works every time, or almost every time, but it's very difficult to package a spare in cars of this vintage. This car never had a reverse light, so we took a couple measures there to increase visibility in the rear. Hiding up underneath of the car in a position that you'll never see it, but you do get to enjoy the light that it throws off, is one of the Icon BR LED arrays, and that's hooked up to the transmission, so it's auto on when you're in reverse. We also took what would have been the original license plate light and inserted a small LED light there to complement the larger array. For license plate light, we found this super cool vintage license plate frame on eBay and thought that would work really nice, and it did. It came out really good. The license plate is a really rare original California plate correct for this year, and this is one of the only years where you only were required to run one plate. It's my understanding that was because of the material shortages due to the war. Speaking of the war, a lot of the sort of art deco grace and streamlined modern beauty of this car is really just a fact that the car companies had not redeployed all of their assets back to making cars after the war. So it took a little while couple years in fact for them to tool up new models so everyone wanted a new car you had prosperity returning to our cultures and you had guys coming back looking to, for a treat for themselves so GM like most American car companies merely did light dress up on their pre-war models so this car looks very similar to its 1941 older brother the only difference was things that they could do cost effectively and quickly, such as the bright work and trim. 
So I hope you appreciate this lengthy video. I thought that this car really deserved a little bit more attention and time, and I wanted to make sure I could tell you most of the stories behind building such a car. Let's try that again with the locker engaged. So as always, really appreciate you taking the time to follow my brand and watch these videos. Um, please spread the word, tell your friends, um, make your comments, like the video, share it, blah, blah, blah. Um, I don't have... Uh, you know, media managers, it's a small company with a big mouth. I try and manage all that stuff. So feel free to ask questions or give us a call, 818-280-3333. Our website is icon4x4.com. Facebook is just me, Jonathan Ward. And our Instagram, which is a lot of fun because it covers not just the cars that we design and build, but all the things I enjoy, is icon4x4. So be well. Thanks again. See you next time.